Hi everybody, it's Mrs. V here. Um, I wanted to share a book with you that I have. I know a lot of you are learning about American history and this is a great book, so I wanted to share it with you. Okay, this is called Those Rebels, John and Tom by Barbara Curley, illustrated by Edwin Fotheringham. The true story of how one gentleman, short and stout, and another, tall and lean, formed a surprising alliance, committed treason, and helped launch a new nation. When John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were young, they were very different. John skipped school to fly kites and shoot marbles. He loved swimming, hunting, wrestling, and the occasional boxing match, just for kicks. That's him here. Tom didn't skip school. He skipped a recess to study Greek grammar. He loved dancing, playing the violin, and reading all the books in his father's library. When John and Tom grew up, they were even more different. John liked to talk and talk. In college, he joined a debating club so that he could talk some more. And when he became a lawyer, he found he could talk for hours without using any notes, a handy skill in the courtroom. He loved nothing more than to battle wits in a lively argument. Tom was shy and dreaded speaking in front of crowds. Talking too much made his voice hoarse. When he became a lawyer, he found it didn't, he didn't enjoy presenting cases to the jury, a bit of a problem in the courtroom. He hated arguments. If he had an idea, he quietly wrote it down. John lived in a sturdy farmhouse in Braintree, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. He found farming very muddy, but he liked it very well. Now, in these quotation marks here, these are actual quotes from things that our friends here have said. So this is actually a nonfiction text, even though it looks like a fiction text because it has all these really nice illustrations, but it's actually a nonfiction text, which I really like about this. Okay, so he found farming very muddy, but he liked it very well. So he must have said that somewhere. Clearing stumps to plow his fields and then carting out manure to fertilize them. When he wasn't in the courtroom, he planted corn, pruned fruit trees, and chased his chickens and ducks. Tom leveled a mountain to build his estate of Monticello, Monticello in Virginia. Architecture was one of his favorite amusements, calculating windows, walls, and wainscots to a sixteenth of an inch. When he wasn't in the courtroom, he maintained his accounts, surveyed his lands, and dined on chicken and duck. He dined on the chicken and duck. And the other one chased him around. <laughs> George and his government took away Americans' right to a fair trial. They shut down public meetings, George's army occupied the city of Boston and his navy patrolled the Atlantic Ocean from England clear to the Virginia coast. When John stayed in Boston for work, George's troops exercised early morning, early each morning. Fifes squealing, feet stomping, and drums rat-a-tatting. How was anyone supposed to sleep through a racket like that? When Tom sent his tobacco down river to market, he could sell it to no country but England, whatever the price. How could anyone pay the bills with a racket like that? And this is all the tobacco, Virginia tobacco here. And then there were all those taxes, a tax on sugar, on coffee and tea, 
on glass, on paint, and on calico cloth. Newspapers, contracts, even decks of cards. King George and his government taxed them all. They thought America was nothing but a big fat piggy bank to be turned upside down and shaken for coins. And so in the fall of 1774, a group of Americans planned a meeting in Philadelphia, a Continental Congress, to figure out what to do about it. Something had to change. John kissed his family goodbye and proudly accepted a spot with the Massachusetts delegation. When he reached Philadelphia, he was stuck by the neatly laid out streets and the elegant buildings and oh, the food. But when he met his fellow delegates, he fretted. Each man had his own character and temper, his own principles and views. Somehow these 50 gentlemen, total strangers, would need to join forces. John thought the fledging the fledgling Congress, a nursery of American statesmen. Could he and the other delegates learn how to unite the separate colonies in one common purpose? Day after day, the delegates met to discuss their problem with George. Tedious indeed is our business, slow as snails, John wrote home to his wife, Abigail. Choosing a course of action would not be easy. In the summer of 1775, Tom kissed his family goodbye and proudly rode into Philadelphia to join the Virginia delegation. He toured the museums and drank punch in the taverns and oh, the shopping. He arrived already famous for a pamphlet he'd written calling King George, King George, a blot on the page of history. But as Tom took his seat in Congress, he quickly grew appalled. The delegates agreed on so little and argued so much. Would they ever reach a consensus on what to do? And how could Tom possibly make himself heard above all that noise? And this is the words, nay, 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 everybody saying nay. They're not agreeing. And he took stock of the new delegate from Virginia, John, the son of a farmer and shoemaker from the North. Couldn't help noticing that Tom was impeccably dressed and very soft-spoken with gracious manners that pleased everyone. He was also quite tall. And Tom, the son of the aristocrat planter from the South, couldn't help noticing that John was plainly dressed and spoke rather bluntly with gruff manners that sometimes pleased almost no one. He was also rather short. Tom watched astounded as John battled hour after hour through heated debate, tapping the floor with his walking stick to hammer the words home. How could anyone love to argue that much? And John noted with astonishment that in Congress, Tom slumped down in his chair and never uttered three sentences together. How could anyone who cared that much about Americans sit silently by? Congress had just established a continental army to fight for colonists' rights. And Tom had brought to Philadelphia a powerful weapon of his own, a pen and the skill to use it better than almost any man in America. The delegates now turned to Tom and his mighty pen to justify why Americans were taking up arms. He lunged, parried, and skewered the policies of King George and his government. Tom might be silent in Congress, John realized, but he wasn't afraid to answer King George with his pen. In fact, Tom was so prompt, frank, explicit, and decisive in private conversation that he soon seized upon John's heart. And John's constant arguing might annoy many of those in Congress, but underneath the bluster, Tom discovered was a man so amiable, he later wrote a friend that I announce you will love him if you ever become acquainted with him. 
the two very different men sense that working together, they might accomplish more than by working alone. Perhaps they could compel their fellow delegates to, act, to action. Endless debate, they knew, was no longer an option. King George's troops had already shot colonists in Lexington and Concord and burned Charlestown to the ground. George now vowed to put a speedy end to the rebellion in the colonies and punish the rebels for treason. By 1776, John and Tom felt the time had come for America to break from King George and declare independence, but many delegates still had doubts. How could a small gathering of colonies square off against perhaps the mightiest country in the world? I gave you a zoom because I really like this illustration. It really shows how far away everything is and how powerful Great Britain was at the time. John and Tom knew that a united America depended on a unanimous vote. Could John's powers of persuasion and Tom's skill with a pen convince that naysayers to vote yay? If so, Congress would need to prepare a statement to the world explaining why America should be free. Who could write such a document? More than any other delegate in Congress, John had championed the cause of independence. You should do it, Tom told him. Oh, no, John exclaimed. Any declaration he wrote would be severely criticized for some delegates. He conceded found him obnoxious. The declaration should be written by a delegate from Virginia the oldest and most powerful colony in America. More importantly, John told Tom, you can write 10 times better than I can. Well, Tom replied, if you are decided, I will do as well as I can. In the quiet of his rooms on Market Street, Tom worked on the Declaration of Independence, trying to craft an expression of the American mind in terms so plain and firm that people around the world would rally to America's side. He began with a statement of basic freedoms and ended with a long list of grievances against King George. One grievance, Tom included, was slavery, an issue he had struggled with for years. It was a cruel institution, Tom wrote, and George thwarted every attempt America made to prohibit it. And yet, like many men in Congress, Tom himself owned slaves, as he penned this document on freedom, his 14-year-old slave, Bob Hemings, brought him tea. Hour after hour, Tom sat as, at his little desk, writing and thinking and writing some more. Meanwhile, John prepared himself for the greatest debate of all, the vote on independence. Storm clouds gathered as he stood and faced Congress. Above the crack of lightning and the boom of thunder, John spoke on, trying to convince the, late, the last naysayers to change their minds. From his place with the Virginia delegation, Tom marveled as John rallied the delegates. His power of thought and expression, Tom later wrote, moved us from our seats. Finally, the next morning, after almost two years of turmoil, a united America was ready to vote yay. The delegates now turned to Tom's declaration. He squirmed and suffered as they fine-tuned phrases and trimmed passages, including his condemnation of slavery, an issue the country would not resolve for almost 100 years. They cut and cut until soon Tom's work was only one page long, an expression in terms, plain and firm, of American, American independence. We solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And for the support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives and fortunes and fortunes, I should say, and our sacred honor. In the cities and towns, bells rang out as the declaration was read aloud. 
Americans paraded, lit bonfires, and toasted farewell to England. In New York City, they even pulled down the statue of great of good King George. Throughout the states, the United States, Americans celebrated the end of British oppression. They savored the promise of new of a new future, and they cheered the group of men who left behind family and friends to meet in Philadelphia. Hancock, Lee, Sherman, Livingston, Franklin, Rush, Rodney, Harrison, and all the others who launched a new nation. And those rebels, John and Tom, these are all the signatures here, a little close-up of it. This is the author's note. The end. Hope you enjoyed it.